A small pebble dropped in a pool of still water creates ripples on the surface. These ripples form concentric circular rings around the source of disturbance and spread outward along the surface. When these ripples reach a point on the surface of water, the point starts oscillating up and down. Different points, which are at the same distance from the source of the disturbance, oscillate in phase. That means, all these points reach the crest or trough at the same time. The locus of all such points having the same phase of oscillation is called a wave front. In case of water waves on the surface of water, we observe circular wave fronts. Each circular wave front is a locus of all points having the same phase of oscillation. The propagation of the waves can be understood by studying the propagation of wave fronts. An outward normal drawn at any point on the wave front represents the direction of the wave at that point. In terms of energy, we say that the energy of the wave propagates in a direction perpendicular to the wave front. The speed at which a wave front travels is the speed of the wave. Waves on the surface of water are two-dimensional and hence the wave fronts are circular in shape. But the waves from a source of sound or a source of light in a homogeneous medium spread in all directions and are three-dimensional in nature. Now consider a point source of light placed in a homogeneous and isotropic medium emitting light waves in different directions. If the medium is homogeneous, the speed of light waves is the same throughout the medium and if it is isotropic, it is the same in all directions. The loci of all points which have the same amplitude and vibrate in the same phase forms a sphere with its center at the source of light. Hence, a spherical wave front is generated when a point light source is placed in a homogeneous medium. At a large distance from the source, these spherical wave fronts have large radii of curvatures. A small portion of a spherical wave front at a very large distance from the source can be treated as a plane wave front. In physical optics, we visualize light as waves and wave fronts. In ray optics, we visualize light as rays. A line drawn perpendicular to the wave front in the direction of its propagation is treated as the ray of light in ray optics. Note that a wave front is a surface of constant phase. If a particular wave front is a locus of points with maximum amplitude, it continues to be like that as it propagates through the medium. Christian Huygens proposed a geometrical method known as the Huygens principle for finding the shape and location of a wave front at some instant from the knowledge of the shape and location of the same wave front at an earlier instance. According to Huygens' principle, each point of a wave front is a source of a secondary disturbance and generates spherical secondary wavelets, which spread out in all directions with the speed of the wave in that medium. If a tangential surface common to all these secondary spherical wave fronts is drawn, then it gives the new position of the wave front at a later instant. This surface envelopes all the secondary wavelets. To understand Huygens' principle, let us now consider a primary wave front AB propagating in a homogeneous medium. Then, according to the Huygens' principle, 
Each point of AB acts as a source of secondary disturbance. The secondary wavelets emanated from these points are spherical in shape and spread in all directions at a speed equal to the speed of the wave. If the speed of the wave is V, then in time t, the radius of the spherical wavelets becomes Vt. The tangential surface common to all these spheres in the forward direction gives the shape and location of the new wave front after t seconds. In the image, the surface A dash B dash represents the location of the wave front AB after t seconds. The secondary wavelets must be directed backward as well as forward from the secondary point sources. If this would be correct, we would get a surface such as A double dash B double dash as a back wave. But experimental results do not show the presence of any such back wave. In order to explain this, Huygens proposed that the intensity of the spherical wavelets is not uniform in all directions, but is maximum in the forward direction and zero in the backward direction. Hence, the wavelets as well as the whole wave always propagate in the forward direction only. Now let us use Huygens principle to find the location and shape of a plane wave front at a later instant of time t. Let AB be a plane wave front at time t equal to zero. According to Huygens principle, each point of AB acts as a source of secondary wavelets. The radii of these spheres will be Vt after t seconds. The plane touching these small spheres in the forward direction gives the shape and location of the new wave front after t seconds. When light waves are incident on an interface of two transparent media, light gets partially refracted and partially reflected. Using the Huygens principle, we can derive the laws of refraction and reflection and show that these laws are consistent with the wave nature of light. Let us first consider the refraction of light when it propagates from a rarer medium to a denser medium. Let S, S dash be the boundary of the two transparent media, medium 1 and medium 2, in which the speeds of light are V1 and V2 respectively. Consider a plane wave front AB in medium 1 that is propagating towards the interface SS dash. A normal to the wave front in the direction of its propagation gives the direction of the wave. Let A dash A be the direction of the wave front AB in medium 1. If I is the angle between the wave front AB in medium 1, and the interface SS dash, then the angle of incidence is also equal to I. Assume that at T is equal to 0, only point A of the wave front AB is in contact with the interface SS dash. The shape and the location of the wave front at any subsequent instant of time can be found by constructing secondary wavelets. Since point A is on the interface SS dash, part of the secondary wavelet originated from this point refracts into medium 2 and a part is reflected back into medium 1. If reflection at the interface is neglected, hemispherical wave fronts from point A propagate into medium 2. As the wave front travels from medium 1 to medium 2, different points of the wave front are incident on the interface SS dash at different instants of time. If the point B is incident on the interface at C 
after t seconds. Then, bc is equal to v1t. Since the speed of the light in medium 2 is v2, during the same period, the secondary wavelet generated at point A at time t is equal to 0, will have formed a hemisphere of radius v2t. Secondary wavelets from different points on the interface form hemispheres of different radii in medium 2. If we construct a plane CD tangential to all these hemispherical secondary wavelets, it would represent the refracted wave front after t seconds. Note that AD being the radius of the hemispherical wavelet generated at A, it is equal to V2T and the direction of AD is the direction of the refracted wave in medium 2. If the angle made by the refracted wave front CD with the interface SS dash is R, then it is same as the angle of refraction. Since angle BAC is equal to I, from the triangle ABC we have sin I is equal to BC by AC. Similarly, as the angle ACD is equal to R, from the triangle ACD we have sin R is equal to AD by AC. From these two equations, we get sin I by sin R is equal to BC by AD. On substituting the values of BC and AD in the equation, and on further simplification, we get sin I by sin R is equal to V1 by V2. Let this be equation 1. We know that if light travels from a rarer medium to a denser medium, it bends towards the normal and hence the angle of refraction R is less than the angle of incidence I. From equation 1, we can conclude that if R is less than I, then V2 must be less than V1. Thus, according to Huygens' wave theory, the speed of light in a denser medium is lesser than the speed of light in a rarer medium. This is in contradiction to the assumptions made by Newton in his corpuscular theory of light. In 1850, it was Foucault who first determined the speed of light experimentally and confirmed that the speed of light indeed is less in water than in air. If C is the speed of light in vacuum, then the refractive index of medium 1, N1, is equal to C by V1, and the refractive index of medium 2, N2, is equal to C by V2. Therefore, N1 by N2 is equal to V2 by V1, which can also be written as V1 by V2 is equal to N2 by N1. Let this be equation 2. From equations 1 and 2, we can write sin I by sin R is equal to N2 by N1. This can also be written as N1 sin I is equal to N2 sin R. This is Snell's law of refraction. Let us now consider the refraction of successive wave fronts at the interface SS dash. If the wave fronts as shown represent crests of a wave, then the distance between the two successive wave fronts in a medium is equal to the wavelength of light in the medium. Let the wavelength of light in medium 1 be lambda 1 and in medium 2 be lambda 2. If the wave front AB is considered, the points A and B reach the points D and C at the same time. As such, the number of wave fronts between B and C 
is equal to the number of wavefronts between A and D. Therefore, BC by AD is equal to lambda 1 by lambda 2. Since BC is equal to V1T and AD is equal to V2T, we have lambda 1 by lambda 2 is equal to V1 by V2. Let this be equation 3. Equation 3 implies that when a light wave refracts into a denser medium, its wavelength as well as velocity decreases. From equations 1 and 3, we can write sin i by sin r is equal to lambda 1 by lambda 2. In case of light traveling from a denser medium to a rarer medium, the refraction of light is as shown. Using Huygens' principle, we can prove equation 1 for refraction of light when it travels from a denser to a rarer medium. Since the speed of light in medium 1 is less than the speed of light in medium 2, the angle of incidence is also less than the angle of refraction. If the angle of incidence I is increased, correspondingly the angle of refraction also increases. For a particular angle of incidence known as critical angle, the angle of refraction becomes 90 degrees and the wave grazes along the interface SS dash. If the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, we will have total internal reflection. As such, the laws of refraction are consistent with the wave nature of light. In ray optics, you have already studied about the laws of reflection. Now, we shall study them again but with wave theory as the basis. In order to prove the laws of reflection based on wave theory, let us consider the reflection of a plane wavefront A-B- from a plane reflecting surface SS-. Let AB be the position of the wavefront when it just touches the reflecting surface at the instance T is equal to zero. A-A -A gives the direction of propagation of the wavefront and let us assume that the wavefront is incident on the surface SS dash at an angle I and the speed of the light in the given medium is V. At T is equal to zero, the point A is in contact with the surface SS dash. The secondary wavelets from points other than A have maximum intensity in the forward direction and zero intensity in the backward direction and thus they travel in the forward direction. Since the surface SS dash is a reflecting surface, the intensity of the secondary wavelets from A is maximum in the backward direction and minimum in the forward direction. Thus we can say that the secondary wavelets from A propagate back into the same medium. Let us assume that after t seconds, the point B of the wavefront AB is incident on the surface SS dash at point C. Then, BC is equal to VT. During the same period, the hemispherical secondary wavelet from A would also have attained a radius equal to Vt. Hence, a hemisphere with its center at A and radius equal to Vt represents the secondary wavelet that originated from A at time t is equal to zero. If a surface, such as CE, tangential to the hemispherical wavefront and passing through the point C is constructed, then CE would represent the reflected wavefront. AE is the radius of the hemispherical wavelet generated at the point A.
and is equal to Vt. That means Ae is equal to BC is equal to Vt. The angle that the reflected wavefront CE makes with the surface SS dash is the angle of reflection. Let it be theta. The two triangles AEC and ABC are right angled triangles with a common side AC and with two other equal sides AE and BC. Therefore, these two triangles are congruent. Hence, the angle BAC is equal to the angle ECA. This means the angle of incidence I is equal to the angle of reflection theta. This is the law of reflection. Let us now understand the behavior of a plane wavefront as it undergoes refraction through a prism as well as through a lens. Consider a plane wavefront AB passing through a glass prism. As the wavefront AB passes through the prism, the point A travels for longer distances in the glass than the point B. Since the speed of light waves is less in glass, point A and the lower portion of the wavefront passing through the prism are delayed and as a result there is a tilt in the emerging wavefront A-B- When a plane wavefront is refracted through a convex lens, it becomes a converging spherical wavefront and converges at a point on the principal focus. On the other hand, if a plane wavefront is refracted through a concave lens, we get a diverging spherical wavefront. If a plane wave is incident on a concave mirror, upon reflection, it becomes a converging spherical wave. Note that the time taken from a point on the object to the corresponding point on the image is the same measured along any ray. Observe the image formation of a point object placed before a convex lens. Although the ray going through the center traverses a shorter path, because of the slower speed in glass, the time taken is seen for rays traveling near the edge of the lens. Let us now discuss about the Doppler effect of light. The apparent change in the frequency of light due to the relative motion between the source of light and the observer is called the Doppler effect. You have already studied about the Doppler effect related to sound waves. Let us recollect the expressions we had derived for the Doppler effect of sound waves. Let Vs be the velocity of the source, Vo be the velocity of the observer. Both these velocities are relative to the medium in which they propagate and act along the line joining them. Also, let nu naught be the frequency of sound when the source and the observer are stationary. Nu be the frequency when the source is in motion and the observer is at rest. And nu dash be the frequency when the observer is in motion and the source is at rest. Then, as for the Doppler effect for sound waves, we have nu is equal to nu naught into 1 minus Vs by V. And nu dash is equal to nu naught into 1 plus Vo by V. Let them be equations 1 and 2. Thus in the case of sound waves, since the velocities of the source and the observer are relative to the medium in which they propagate, the effect on the frequency when the source moves away from the observer is different from when the observer moves away from the source. 
but this is not true in the case of Doppler effect for light waves. Let us now understand the reason for this. We know that the speed of an electromagnetic wave is same in any inertial frame of reference. As a consequence, for the purpose of Doppler effect of light, a source of light moving through a medium in which the observer is at rest and an observer moving through that medium with the source at rest are physically identical situations. Hence, we cannot use equations 1 and 2 in case of light waves. The expression for the Doppler effect of light is predicted based on the theory of relativity. The expression is nu is equal to nu naught into square root of c minus v by c plus v. Let this be equation 3. In this expression, c is the speed of light in vacuum and v is the velocity of the source with respect to the observer. V is taken along the line joining the source and the observer. V is positive when the source moves away from the observer and is negative when the source approaches the observer. Equation 3 can be mathematically manipulated as shown to obtain equation 4. If V is very much less than C, then, v square by c square is much smaller than 1 in equation 4, and hence, it can be neglected to obtain equation 5, where nu is equal to nu naught into 1 minus v by c. Equation 5 can be rewritten as nu minus nu naught whole divided by nu naught is equal to minus of v by c. If the change in the frequency, nu minus nu naught, is written as delta nu, then the fractional change in the frequency delta nu by nu naught is equal to minus v by c. Doppler effect of light has an important bearing in astronomy. When light emitted by stars is passed through a prism, a spectrum is obtained. In the visible part of this spectrum, lines of different wavelengths along with some intermediary dark lines are present. If a star moving away from us, there is an apparent increase in the wavelengths due to the Doppler effect of light and hence the whole pattern of the spectrum gets shifted towards longer wavelengths. This is called the red shift. Our universe is continuously expanding. The astronomers have found an experimental proof for this in the red shift. When a star is moving towards the observer, there is an apparent decrease in the wavelengths and the whole pattern of the spectrum gets shifted towards shorter wavelengths. This is called the blue shift. It is important to note that we can measure either the red shift or the blue shift very accurately by comparing the apparent wavelengths of the spectral lines with the known laboratory wavelengths. When two waves reach a point in space at the same time, the resultant displacement of the particle is given by the principle of superposition. According to this principle, the resultant displacement, y, is the vector sum of the displacements, y1 and y2, caused by two waves. For coherent sources, the waves generated by them will have the same amplitude, same frequency and the phase difference between them is constant with respect to time. The waves from coherent sources can interfere constructively or destructively. If they interfere constructively at a point, the individual displacements 
are numerically added to give the resultant displacement at that point. When they interfere destructively at any point, the individual displacements cancel each other and the resultant displacement at that point is the minimum. You have already learned that for constructive interference, the path difference must be equal to n lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of light used and n is an integer. In terms of the phase difference, phi, the condition for the constructive interference is given by phi is equal to 0 or plus or minus 2 pi or plus or minus 4 pi and so on. For destructive interference, either the path difference is equal to n plus half into lambda or the phase difference phi is equal to plus or minus pi or plus or minus 3 pi and so on. If light has wave nature, it must exhibit the phenomenon of interference. When Huygens proposed the wave theory of light in 1678, there was no experimental proof for the interference of light. Subsequently, in 1801, Thomas Young demonstrated experimentally that light exhibits the phenomenon of interference. Let's study about Young's double slit experiment. Take an opaque screen with a small pinhole S and place a monochromatic light source to the left of the screen. Now, the pinhole S acts as a point source of light and propagates spherical light waves to the right of the screen in all directions. Place another opaque screen with two very closely separated pinholes, S1 and S2, to the right of the first screen. When S1 and S2 are illuminated by the incident light from S, they behave like two point sources of light and emit spherical waves to the right of the screen. In fact, S1 and S2 behave like virtual coherent sources of light. These spherical waves from S1 and S2 can be made to interfere on the screen GG dash placed in their path. They form a series of bright and dark bands called interference fringes on the screen. The bright bands correspond to constructive interference of light and dark bands correspond to destructive interference of light. Let's now study the interference pattern in detail. Let the distance between S1 and S2 be D and the distance between the pinholes and the screen be D. Let AB be the perpendicular bisector of the line joining S1 and S2 and O be the point of intersection of the line and the screen. We shall now consider an arbitrary point P on the screen along a line GG dash perpendicular to AB and passing through O. Let the distance OP be X. Light from the two sources S1 and S2 covers a distance of S1P and S2P respectively to reach the point P. If P corresponds to an interference maxima, then the path difference S2P minus S1P is equal to N lambda. Let this be equation 1. On the other hand, if P corresponds to an interference minima, the path difference S2P minus S1P is be equal to N plus half into lambda. Let this be equation 2. Here, Lambda is the wavelength of the light waves and n is an integer. From the diagram, as shown, we can write that S2P square 
is equal to d square plus x plus d by 2 whole square. This is equal to d square plus x square plus d square by 4 plus xd. Similarly, S1P square is equal to d square plus x minus d by 2 whole square. This is equal to d square plus x square plus d square by 4 minus xd. Therefore, S2P square minus S1P square is equal to 2xd. This equation can also be written as S2P minus S1P is equal to 2xd by S2P plus S1P. If capital D is much greater than the small d, then we can assume that S2P plus S1P is approximately equal to 2D. Then the path difference S2P minus S1P is equal to X into D by D. Let this be equation 3. From equations 1 and 3, the condition for point P to correspond to a bright band is x into d by d is equal to n lambda or x is equal to n lambda d by d. Let this be equation 4. From equations 2 and 3, if x d by d is equal to n plus half into lambda, then at point P we will have a dark fringe. That is, for a dark fringe, x is equal to n plus half into lambda into d by d. Let this be equation 5. Here, n is equal to 0, or plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2, and so on. The distance between the centers of consecutive bright fringes, or consecutive dark fringes, is called the fringe width. If xn and xn plus 1 are the distances of the nth and n plus 1th bright or dark fringes from the central bright fringe, then mathematically fringe width is equal to xn plus 1 minus xn. From equation 4, the fringe width for a bright fringe can be written as lambda d by d. From equation 5, the fringe width for a dark fringe can also be written as lambda d by d. Hence, the fringe width is the same for both the dark and bright fringes, which means the dark and bright fringes are equally spaced. If the fringe width is represented by beta, then beta is equal to lambda d by d. Let this be equation 6. If the central point O is considered to be equidistant from both the sources S1 and S2, then S1O is equal to S2O. This condition corresponds to N equal to 0 condition for a bright fringe, and hence we will have a bright spot at O. Now consider a line on the screen that passes through the point O and is perpendicular to both the lines AB and GG dash. All the points on this line will be equidistant from S1 and S2. And hence, we will have a bright central fringe along this line. On either side of this central bright fringe, we will have dark fringes. If N is taken as 0 in the equation 5, we get the value of X equal to lambda, d by 2d. Likewise, we will have alternate dark and bright fringes on either side of the central bright fringe. Note that a particular fringe corresponds to the locus of points with a constant path difference of S2P minus S1P. Mathematically, locus of such points represent a hyperbola. In fact, the fringe pattern is strictly a hyperbola.
but for a large distance d the fringes will be very nearly straight lines now look at equation 6 once again the fringe width of an interference pattern is directly proportional to the wavelength of the interfering light waves the fringe width is maximum for red light and minimum for violet light The fringe width is inversely proportional to the distance d between the two sources S1 and S2. If we decrease the distance between the two sources, the fringe width increases. One more factor that influences the fringe pattern is the distance d between the sources and the screen. Fringe width is directly proportional to d. The actual separation between the fringes increases with the increase in distance of the screen from the two sources. Note that the angular separation of the fringes remains constant as the value of D changes. In the experiment discussed so far, the original point source S is assumed to be on the perpendicular bisector of the line joining S1 and S2, and the central bright fringe occurs at O. Let's now observe the changes that take place in the interference pattern when point source S is shifted to a different position S dash. Let point Q be the midpoint of S1 and S2 and the angle SQS dash be phi. The central bright fringe is now shifted from O to O dash. The location of O dash is such that all the three points S dash, Q and O dash lie on a straight line and the angle SQS dash is equal to angle OQO dash. So far, we have observed the interference pattern formed by light waves emitted by two point sources. All the fringes are straight lines even though the waves from the sources are spherical in shape. If we add some more pairs of point sources horizontally, each pair of point sources form the interference pattern at the same location. Hence, the intensity of the bright fringes increases. If the point sources are replaced with slits, a similar straight interference pattern is formed with increased intensity. What happens if we use two separate sources of light in place of S1 and S2? We don't observe any interference pattern on the screen. This is because the light waves coming out from two independent sources of light will not have any fixed phase relationship. Hence, they behave like incoherent light sources. We do not observe any interference pattern even when we use an ordinary monochromatic light source to illuminate both S1 and S2. The atoms in an ordinary light source radiate light in an unsynchronized and random phase relationship. Thomas Young had overcome this problem by using light waves from a single slit to illuminate S1 and S2. In this setup, any abrupt phase change in the source will reflect an exactly similar phase changes in the light coming from S1 and S2. Since laser light is coherent, we observe interference pattern when S1 and S2 are illuminated by laser light. Let us 